Just a little bit more. I hear still some beeps coming in. Um, please be sure to mute your um, mic just so that we don't have, you know, unnecessary background noise. And um, why don't we get started? Um, we do have a lot of material to cover here. Hi, my name is Rashad Motez. I'm the Director of Strategic Business Development for WIDA. And um, welcome. Um, we're very happy and excited to be doing this um, webinar on Opportunity Zones. Um, it's going to be a general overview of the Opportunity Zone program, how they work, and uh, what opportunities we see for them um, in Wisconsin. Um, we're honored to have who's a partner at Push Blackwell, um, and the primary presenter. And Rebecca has been very well versed um, in, and that really is considered an expert in opportunity zones. More importantly, she has actually done um, legal work related to opportunity zones and is really at the end of what she's done. Um, so before I turn it over to her, please um, put your um, mics on mute so that we don't have um, you know, background noise that would um, um, disrupt the um, website. So with no further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rashad. <clears throat> um, very happy to uh, be here today to uh, talk about opportunity zones. I'm always conscious when I do a presentation on opportunity zones that people come at it with varying levels of um, background knowledge and also from varying perspectives too. This is the kind of program that um, there are a lot of stakeholders um, and uh, I'll try to, I'll try my best to, to speak to um, various perspectives and interests um, as we run through these slides um, and, and anticipate some of the questions um, that are likely popping up in, in your mind as, as you're listening. Um, so a good place to start is a general introduction to uh, the purpose of the program, of the opportunities of the program. Um, here we go. So, and, and this is important to keep in mind throughout our discussion because the purpose of the program really also informs the way that um, Treasury and the CDFI fund are, are going to interpret um, some of these regulations that in, in the statute that we'll discuss as we go along. So the, the number that's thrown out um, is that there's $6 trillion of wealth in the stock market alone. And the purpose of the Opportunity Zones program is to incentivize investors that are holding that wealth to pull it out of the stock market and to invest it in underserved communities, to invest it in communities that aren't seeing private capital investments. Um, it, this is not does not relate exclusively to the stock market. Um, it relates to uh, uh, gains being held anywhere, anything that would qualify as a capital gain. So it could be wealth being held in uh, real estate. Um, you know, it, it could be equities. It, it could take on various forms. But the idea is, how do we incentivize people, taxpayers who are sitting on wealth, uh, to take that wealth and to invest it in communities that need it the most. So that is the, the basic premise of this. Um, it's really at this point in time, a law in process, still in process. 
a little background is helpful because as we go through this, um, you'll hear me say that we're still looking for guidance on, on various things, or you'll hear me talk about some guidance that was received at various times. So um, just to put all of that in context, I think it's helpful to, um, to kind of establish the timeline that, that we're looking at with this law. So first, Opportunity Zones were created in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act um, of 2017. Uh, and it, they are a part of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, it's managed by the Department of Treasury and the Community Development Finan Financial Institutions Fund. Um, so when, the, when the, the code first came out, um, I would say it was, it was kind of the skeleton of, of a law. And it, um, those of us who practice in the area, my background personally is in the area of new markets tax credits and other tax incentivized uh, real estate development. Um, <clears throat> and this in opportunity zones is very reminiscent of, of new markets in the sense that one, it is the largest economic development program in the last 15 years since new markets tax credits. And two, it really does borrow, there's echoes, um, it really does borrow from certain um, uh, definitional terms, structures, um, it, it leans on some, on, on some things that are familiar to those who, who practice in, in the new markets field. So as a new markets practitioner, um, this was an obvious and exciting um, new, new law and, um, and, and something that, that I immediately wanted to dig into. Um, but as I said, the, the first, the statute, when it first came out, left a, a lot of questions open. Um, and there, there was a need um, to, for additional guidance to really put, um, put the program into practice. So we um, were told to anticipate additional guidance. Um, my firm is part of a national working group through Novogratic uh, that was um, that is still um, providing comments and analysis and comments to Treasury to assist in Treasury's um, uh, in the compilation of their own guidance and how they're thinking about how to make this program as effective as it can be. There are also similar working groups um, through various trade organizations. The American Bar Association has one. Numerous other um, trade associations have similar working groups that um, were there really viewing the statute in, in light of what they want to see, what they think is necessary to make the program effective and providing additional um, feedback to Treasury um, in hopes that that is ultimately reflected in the guidance that is released. So Treasury issued its first round of guidance in October. Um, and that round of guidance, in my opinion, really did uh, really did give everybody the peace of mind that Treasury wants this program to be effective, to be powerful. Um, and 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 it, it seemed to me that the guidance as you're reading through it really opens the program up to more users rather than rather than closes it. Um, that being said, it, it was obvious and, and Treasury made clear that more guidance was needed. And so we anticipate um, a second round of guidance, uh, hopefully the, the, the last round, at least in this, you know, kind of initial um, release. Uh, we, we had heard by the end of the year, but you know we're, we're hoping in the, in the next couple months um, that we should have the next round of guidance. Um, as we go through, I'll talk about what kinds of, of deals we can do now and what kinds of deals we think we need to wait for additional guidance um, in order to in order to be comfortable be comfortable doing. But but know as, as you're listening that, you know, this really is a law where the skeleton is there. We've filled out the meat a little bit with that first round of guidance, um, but we're still kind of waiting for kind of the final layer to answer some pretty critical questions um, that will really determine the ultimate impact and effectiveness of the program. So I call this my roadmap slide. 
uh, you know, there's this is the kind of program, it's very difficult to talk about one piece of it without having knowledge of another piece. And so, um, we, but we kind of have to go through it. We got to put your pants on one leg at a time. So we're, <laughs> I'm going to walk you through it one piece at a time, understanding that um, in order to really to really get the full grasp of each piece, you, you need the knowledge um, that you won't get until we get to the next piece. But um, this roadmap will, will give you a general overview. Um, and, and just as you listen, as questions come up, you're going to have them. And hopefully by the end of the time, I will have answered most of them. Um, so the, the program generally works uh, like this. Taxpayers can get capital gains, tax deferral, and more for making timely investments in qualified opportunity funds, which invest in qualified opportunity zone property. Um, so those are, we're going to talk about benefits. We're going to talk about what making timely investments in funds means. We're, we're going to talk about what funds are. We're going to talk about what qualified opportunity zone property is. Um, and, and I'll kind of lead you back to this slide to help you kind of continue to piece these, these different uh, parts together. Um, so because there's no good place to start, let, let's start by talking about what um, qualified opportunity zones are. So if, if you look at qualified opportunity zone property, a large aspect of that is that um, tangible property is located in an opportunity zone. That's one qualification for it. So what is a qual what is an opportunity zone? This is really, um, this is again, a place-based program. This is the, 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 in, the impetus for this is to increase private capital investments into low income underserved communities. So those opportunity zones are essentially the communities that have been designated um, to receive the benefits of this program. So uh, each state um, was able to, uh, so th these are based on census tracts, low income communities census tracts. Uh, for those who are familiar with new markets, it's the same designation, low income community census tracts. Um, but where something might qualify for new markets because it's a low income community, for opportunity zones, states um, could only designate 25% of their low-income community census tracts as opportunity zones. So this was done um, early in 2018. Opportunity zones, I think the, the last of all of the states were certified in May, I believe. Um, these The designation, the opportunity zone designations, uh, as they stand now, are are, this is where they will be until 2027 when they disappear. Um, there are, unless the law changes, which it, it could, and there is already um, some legislative, um, uh, some people working to have, you know, certain disaster areas qualify as opportunity zones and to expand those zones in some way. But as it stands now, opportunity zones that are designated in each state and certified in each state are, it is what it is, they, they are not going to change. And, um, and so if you have property that you wanna develop and you wanna take advantage of this program, but it's not in a zone, there's really not, nothing you can do about it, you know, unless the law changes itself. So the question then is, um, how, how are all these zones designated and determined? And I won't spend too much time on this because the fact of the matter is it's it is done. Um, but it is important to know that that there was dialogue and discussion um, between the state and various municipalities, um, and uh, and and an effort to um, place opportunity zones in areas that that the state understood were already going to be um, areas of investment um, for particular municipalities. So, you know, I, I live and practice in Milwaukee. If you laid Milwaukee's opportunity zones, um, if you did an overlay of their opportunity zones over the ver various kind of critical areas for development um, that the city has prioritized, 
it is it is a, a very um, strong match between between those two. So 30th Street Industrial Corridor, Menominee Valley, Harbor District, Aerotropolis, near West Side. It's parts of the city um, that have been um, identified by the city as as being in need of um, of the kind of private capital that this program can bring. Um, the it's it, this. Uh, kind of graphic on the right elements that the states incorporate into their zone selection proper, um, process. It's interesting. I think it's interesting to see what different states did. Personally, um, I've, I've done quite a bit of traveling, talking about opportunity zones and talking to people about them. And I think Wisconsin did a really nice job uh, of, of choosing and making difficult decisions, certainly, but, but choosing zones that are meaningful and could really um, bring impactful change um, to the state. Um, by contrast, I, I sat next to somebody from who is the uh, economic development director for the city of Albuquerque and had newly taken that job. And when she got into her office, she looked at where the zones were and they were in completely random areas in her city that um, they, they really were not on their map for development and they didn't have great interest in pursuing them. And she really felt like that was a lost opportunity um, uh, to uh, to do something um, with opportunity zones in, in the state. Um, oops. Here we go. So if we're looking at a map of, of Wisconsin. Um, I, I would point you, if you want to know where opportunity zones are, you can go to the CDFI website and they have, you know, kind of very layered maps that you can walk through. A real easy one is that is Novogratic. Um, if you just Google Novogratic Opportunity Zone Mapping Tool, um, that'll pop up and you just enter an address and, and it'll tell you if it's in a zone or not in the map of whether, or you can enter a city or a state um, and something like this will pop up. So the areas in gray are Opportunity Zones. As you'll see, um, they are in most of the major urban areas. Again, these are by census tract. So some cities have multiple zones, some have a couple. Um, they, there are also rural zones, um, some um, certain uh, Indian reservations might be opportunity zones, um, but these are designated by, by census tract and they are kind of nicely scattered through, throughout the state. So all right, back to our map. <clears throat> so we know what opportunity zones are, and again we're talking about taxpayers getting some tax benefits for making investments in funds that invest in opportunity zone property. So quickly, I wanna to just touch on what a fund is and then we'll circle back. Um, a lot of people think that a fund must be, uh, must be if you're from the new markets world, maybe it's something like your, your sub-CDE, it's, it's an organization, um, it's something that's certified by treasury. That is not the case with this program. And that is one of the huge um, distinguishing factors that could make this program um, much larger uh, and, and more impactful than, than some other um, development incentive, tax incentive program. So a, a fund is in essence a, a, an entity that's organized as a corporation or a partnership for the purpose of investing in qualified opportunity zone property. So Anyone can create a fund. Um, if, if I wanted to, I could create a fund today by going and, and creating an LLC that's gonna be taxed as a partnership. I need more than one member um, to that LLC, uh, but you know, I create my LLC and I have an operating agreement and my operating agreement says it's being created for the purpose of investing in qualified opportunities on property. I have then created a fund. Um, so opportunity funds self-certify. So once I create that entity, when I, have, when I file my um, tax returns, uh, the IRS has a, a form that I'll supply and I would attach that to my tax returns, certifying that it is an opportunity zone fund. So this is this self-certifying that um, really is a distinguisher. It means that anybody can do this. Anybody can create a fund. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, if you look at the last bullet point here, funds 
are going to take all different forms. There's a lot of flexibility with what they're going to be. So there will certainly be, and, and our friends on Wall Street are, are working hard to build these already, um, large blind funds, multi-asset funds like mutual funds, um, where you know they're going to raise $500 million in, uh, in qualified opportunity zone capital and invest that throughout the country. Um, there also will be small project specific funds, meaning uh, I am a developer, I have a project that's in an opportunity zone um, that, that I want to build, and I may have sold real estate a couple months ago, and maybe I want to use my capital gains from that sale and invest it in that fund and use that to build my own real estate. So, and that is, in that case, that's, that is, you know, one, it could be one taxpayer creating their own fund to do a project that they want to do for themselves. So it can be that simple. It can be as complicated as huge, large, multi-asset blind funds, um, or it could be anything in between. I think a lot of what you're going to see is you're going to see um, uh, real estate projects where a developer is, is looking for multiple investors um, to do one or more um, developments um, using opportunity zone capital. And we'll create a fund and have multiple investors and we'll have to do something similar to what they might do um, for any uh, capital raise where there's a, a private placement memorandum and um, you know, but but a much more simplified fund than some than some huge fund. So um, there is opportunity funds have to hold ninety percent of their assets have to be qualified opportunity zone property. Um, and we'll come back to what this means, but it's important to know that if you have a fund, um, there is going to be a test every one hundred and eighty days. And that test is is 90% of the assets of that fund. Do, do those assets qualify as qualified opportunity zone property? Um, if that test is not, you don't pass that test, there is a, a penalty. Um, and that penalty is equal to the percentage of the shortfall times the underpayment rate, the federal underpayment rate. That's, um, that is equal to 5% at this point right now. So it's the percentage of shortfall times 5%. Um, but there's an Exclusion for a reasonable cause. Um, we're a little, a little unsure how the penalty is going to work because it says it's a monthly penalty, but the test is every six months. Um, we're not entirely sure if I, I think some people have been looking at this test to say that that as long as you have 90% of your assets as qualified opportunity zone property at the 180 day mark, you're good to go, even if it drops under that after that fact, but, you know, potentially if this is a monthly test, um, if, if it, it, we're just not sure how that's going to be charged. It, will it be your period if you don't um, hit the 90% at the 180 day test, at, at the 180 day test, um, or will you have to uh, pay, you know, for six months until the next test when you can show you have met it? We don't know how that's going to work yet. Um, also important to mention that in the October guidance, um, there is reference to um, the forthcoming rules around decertification. So um, we, we do think that um, at some point there are going to be, potentially in the next round of guidance, hopefully, um, some rules put in place as to how um, a taxpayer or a fund might be decertified if potentially um, the 90% asset test wasn't met multiple times in a row, or if potentially, you know, it was under, like well under 90%. We don't really know what those reasons for decertification would be, but but that is that is out there now too. Okay, so we have talked about opportunity zones. We've talked a little bit about what funds are. And so now let's talk about the benefits. So taxpayers get capital gains, tax deferral, and more when they make timely investments in qualified opportunity funds. Um, so let's talk about those tax benefits. First of all, we're talking about capital gains here. Um, that is capital gains um, in order to take advantage of the program are um, what you would invest in a fund. 
So, and the benefits of that are gain deferral, partial forgiveness, and forgiveness of additional gains. And we're going to walk through each of these. So, gain deferral. Essentially, we're saying that when you take your capital gains and you invest it, make a timely investment in a fund, and that timely investment means that from the date of the sale to the date of the investment, it can't be more than 180 days. So that would be a timely investment in a fund. Um, the taxes that you would have paid on those capital gains, had you not chosen to invest them in a fund, are deferred. Uh, and they are deferred for the period that ends upon the earlier of the sale of the taxpayer's interest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund or December 31st, 2026. So let's talk a little bit about that deferral period. Um, it, and, and we'll talk in a little bit about how this is really a, a 10 year hold to get the, the major benefits of the program. We're talking about a 10 year hold. So when we look at this in all likelihood, um, if, you're, if, you are, if you are following this program through to get the 10 year hold, you will not sell, um, taxpayer won't sell the interest in the fund. Um, until 10 years, but this December 31st, 2026 date is, is less than 10 years away. Um, so what happens on December 31st, 2026, if the sale of the interest in the fund hasn't been held, is that there's, hasn't been sold, is that there's a taxable event, essentially. And on that date, um, taxes will, will the, there's a taxable event and you'll have to pay taxes on the original gain in your 20, when you do your 2027 tax return. So in April of 2027, you'll pay taxes on that original gain. Um, the amount of taxes that you'll pay is the lesser of the amount of gain deferred. So that's the original amount of gain that you deferred or the fair market value of the investment in the Qualified Opportunity Fund interest minus taxpayers basis in the Qualified Opportunity Fund interest. And the basis in the fund um, initially is deemed to be zero. So that sounds pretty complicated, but for, for at least for the moment, let's, let's um, assume that the taxpayer is going to invest in something that's going to grow, that's going to appreciate. So in that case, the taxpayer is going to pay the the amount of the gain that was originally deferred. Um, now that's the deferral part, but now we're gonna talk about um, the, uh, the partial forgiveness. So, and this is where the basis becomes important. So originally the basis in the fund is zero, but after um, five years, the basis in the fund steps up to 10%. And if it's held for seven years um, and, and there's, there's a, Kind of timing aspect here, but if it's it's held for seven years and it's stepped up an additional five percent to fifteen percent, and what that means is that um, that step up in basis causes essentially a for a forgiveness, a partial forgiveness of uh, of the taxes that are required to be paid. Um, so I'm going to run through an example here, and hopefully this will help everything make a little bit more sense as we talk about the benefit. So. Here we have our sale in 2018, and this is the sale that um, where, where the taxpayer recognizes capital gains. So within 180 days, the taxpayer makes an investment into a qualified opportunity fund. And in this case, the investment is held for five years. So after five years, the basis in that investment increases by 10% of the deferred gain. That means that up to 90% of the gain is taxed. So if we said that our initial, that the gain that was initially invested was a million dollars, a taxpayer has a million dollars in gain, invest that in a qualified fund within 180 days, then after five years of that investment being held in that fund, the basis is increased by 10%, which means that right after five years, the taxpayer will be taxed on 900,000 in gain rather than a million in gain. Then if it's held for an additional two years, 
there's an additional 5% of step up in basis, which means that now the taxpayer is only going to be taxed on $850,000 of gain rather than a million in gain. So there's a 15% forgiveness of, of what the taxpayer is paying here. Now, a couple things that are really important. Um, remember that on December 31st, 2026, everybody has a taxable event and those taxes need to be paid. That means that if your seven year period extends beyond 2026, you won't, you won't be able to hit the seven years because you already have paid taxes. So what that's done is create a, a deadline of December 31st, 2019, if you want to take advantage of the full seven year hold 15% uh, forgiveness. So if you want to take advantage of that, you need to be invested in a qualified opportunity fund prior to December 31st, 2019. That, because that's the only way you can get to seven years before that taxable event when you have to pay, pay those taxes. Now, all is not lost if, you're, if your capital gains are not in a fund by that time. Um, if you invest by December 31st, 2021, you can still get the benefit of that five-year hold uh, where you have that 10% um, forgiveness in, in your gain. So this is partial forgiveness. This is tax deferral and partial forgiveness. Um, the, the ultimate benefit, you'll, if you'll remember, I talked about ultimately this is kind of a 10-year play. The ultimate benefit is that if you hold for an additional <clears throat> three years, so for 10 years total, then at the end of those 10 years, the basis of the taxpayer's interest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund is equal to the fair market value. And what that means is that any appreciation on that original investment will be tax free. So that is really, this is really the significant part of the program that gets people to, to take a double look. This is not just about tax deferral and about you know, partial forgiveness of your tax bill. This is the ability to have at the end of 10 years, the appreciation of your original investment be tax-free. Now, imagine, I, I talk a lot about real estate when I'm talking about Opportunity Zone funds. Partly that's because I work in real estate. It's what I do. Um, it's also because um, the program right now is just, it's clearer about how it will work effectively for real estate. And there's more open questions as relates to how it works as a venture capital play or for private equity. Um, but you know, I, from the from the venture capital perspective, um, it, I, imagine if you had invested in in Facebook and through an Opportunity Zone program, and you know, ten years later, your appreciation in that investment um, is completely tax free. It's a substantial tax benefit. Okay, so we've talked about our benefits that taxpayers get. Um, uh, by investing capital gains. Um, we've talked a little bit about what Opportunity Zone funds are. So we know that those gains need to be invested in Opportunity Zone funds. Um, and we talked a little bit about Qualified Opportunity Zone property, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit more about that. Um, uh, okay. Okay. So when we're talking about- when we're talking uh, please put uh, microphones on mute, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so when we're talking about um, Opportunity Zone property and what kind of investments actually work for this. Um, so real estate development and renovation in Opportunity Zones works very well. It has to be substantial renovation generally. Um, opening new businesses in Opportunity Zones. Um, expansion of existing businesses or large expansion of businesses already within opportunity zones. So I want to take you back to the idea of impact here that, that I talked about at the very beginning. Remember, this program is about impacting low-income communities. It's not about people with gains just being able to buy property and sit on it. 
um, and, and not have anything change in those communities. The idea here is that this program will only work if you are creating, enhancing, growing. Um, and, and we'll talk about <clears throat> in a little bit why, what in the, in the law actually um, uh, affect those, those requirements. So there's, there's two ways that um, a, a qualified opportunity fund can invest in qualified opportunity zone property. And these are directly or indirectly. So we know the fund, in order to be a fund, has to invest in qualified opportunity zone property. We know we have this 90% asset test um, that has to be met every 180 days where 90% of the fund's assets have to be qualified opportunity zone property. So that can mean qualified opportunity zone property can either be um, partnership interests in a qualified opportunity zone business or stock in a qualified opportunity zone business, or it can be qualified opportunity zone business property. So we call this the indirect versus direct because at the bottom of everything is qualified opportunity zone business property. So if you're a fund, you can either invest in an interest in a business that holds qualified opportunity zone property, or you can invest directly in qualified opportunity zone property. So indirectly or directly. And there's there's a, a lot of advantages to indirect. Um, and it, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it, 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 I think that generally in the industry, we think that the indirect model will be the most common model. But um, there are some some ways that um, the direct model makes a lot of makes a lot of sense also. So if we do the indirect model, we're investing in qualified opportunity zone businesses. And so what is a qualified opportunity zone business? Well, we already know that the business has to hold qualified opportunity zone business property. And we'll get back to that. Um, so it's a trader business in which substantially all of the tangible property owned or leased is qualified opportunity zone business property. And at least 50% of income is derived from active conduct. Um, a substantial portion of intangible property is used in the active conduct of the business and less than 5% uh, unadjusted basis of the property is non-qualified financial property. Um, these, it, for those in the new markets world, um, the 5% non-qualified financial property or NQFP requirement is going to sound very familiar, as is the active conduct of the business, um, as is the list of SIN businesses down at the bottom. So um, in an indirect model, um, a qualified opportunity zone business can't be a commercial golf course, country club, massage parlor, hot tub facility, suntan facility, racetrack, or other facility used for gambling, or any store, the principal business of which is the sale of alcoholic beverages for consumption off-premises. Um, you know, other than these restrictions, the program is very broad and open-ended. Uh, there are, this, this is the li list of excluded businesses. Um, and unlike New Markets Tax Credits that has prohibitions on residential rental property, there's nothing um, in the statute or in the regulations at this time that would lead us to believe that residential re rental property would um, be disallowed for, for this program. A couple of things to point out uh, about these requirements. Um, when, when I talked about uh, that as it stands now, real estate is easier to, um, the, to use opportunity zone capital for real estate deal, it, it's clearer that it fits within the program than to use it for private equity. Um, one of those reasons is that in, in the guidance in October, the guidance stated that with this active conduct requirement that at least 50% of income derived from active conduct um, was active conduct of the business in the zone. And so that's raised a concern for, um, for people that if, for example, you had an Amazon warehouse, uh, the income from that warehouse doesn't really come from the activities of the warehouse that would be in that opportunity zone. The income really comes from people buying those products all over the world. 
So is that a violation here? Are we, are we now just looking at um, point of sale uh, type businesses where, where the business itself, the income that it earns is earned within the zone itself? Um, we, we do think that, that this is going to be uh, clarified and, and expanded to, to not require that, um, that, that location requirement. Um, but, but at this point in time, that's a big question here. Um, also to look at the 5% NQFP, uh, originally there was a concern that if, if your taxpayer was investing in a qualified opportunity fund, and the fund then made the investment in qualified in a qualified opportunity zone business, that business is going to have a chunk of cash um, from that initial investment. But if if there's a maximum of five percent non-qualified financial property, which this would include working capital or cash, um, then that business may be automatically disqualified simply by the fact that a fund made an investment in it. Um, and it hasn't had enough time to use that investment uh, to purchase property or, or put it into other assets. So um, the October regulations came out with uh, what I think is a pretty generous safe harbor for reasonable working capital that's held pursuant to a plan and a schedule for use. So if a qualified opportunity fund makes an investment in a qualified opportunity zone business, that business if it holds that investment um, pursuant to a plan that it has in place and, it, and that plan has a schedule and then it substantially follows that plan and that schedule, it will not be in violation of this NQFP rule um, because there it will be, it will fall under that safe harbor for reasonable working capital. So there's lots of discussions about how detailed that plan needs to be, how extensive it needs to be, how detailed the schedule needs to be, what following it, what um, following it substantially, what substantially means. Um, there are there are certainly some uh, who who would like to play this to um, uh, <laughs> to its to its full conclusion that. As long as if, if you invest in a business and the business says, I'm going to use this to buy some stuff <laughs> within three years, that there's a plan and there's a schedule. Um, we tend to think that that is not, that is not going to be sufficient. Um, but for example, if you have a plan to you know, purchase identified equipment over you know, a series of, of a year or two, or you have a plan, you have identified property and the plan is to purchase the property, um, and then to renovate the property according to a construction schedule, um, that that uh, that that would work for for this purpose. Okay, so um, the the top. I'm going to go back to the top of the um, qualified. Unfortunately, I can't figure out how to go backwards, but that's okay. Um, the top of the of what is qualified opportunity zone business is that substantially all of the tangible property of that business is qualified opportunity zone business property. Um, the October guidance told us that substantially all means at least 70%. Um, so 70% of the tangible property of a business has to be qualified opportunity zone business property in order for that business to be a qualified opportunity zone business. So what is qualified opportunity zone business property? And, and also this keep this in mind for our direct investment also. So a direct investment would be the fund investing directly into qualified opportunity zone business property. And when I said that the indirect investment seems to be favored, one of the reasons the indirect investment is favored is because if you invest in uh, if the fund invests in a business, only 70% of that business's tangible property has to be qualified opportunity zone property. But if the fund invests directly in property, you'll remember our 90% asset test. So then 90% of the fund's assets have to be qualified opportunity zone property. So 
qualified opportunity zone business property is tangible property used in a trade or business acquired by purchase from an unrelated party after December 31st, 2017. During substantially all of the holding period, substantially all of the use is in a qualified opportunity zone. And the original use in the zone commences with a taxpayer or taxpayer substantially improves the property. So those last two original use substantial improvement, that's an either or test. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna walk through each of these um, to make sure that, that they are clear. So, um, so any tangible property has to be used in, in the business's trader business. Um, the second one is, is important, and this, I think, trips a lot of people up, and, and I, would, I would question, I have some misgivings about it, but it is what it is. So um, it's only qualified opportunities on business property if it's acquired by purchase from an unrelated party after December 31st, 2017. That means that if you already own property, you cannot use you cannot take your gains, invest in a fund, and then have that fund invest in property you already owned unless you own less than 19.9% of that fund. So what this means is it's difficult for um, property owners, developers, if they already own property, to use Opportunity Zone capital to, finance, to help finance their, their project as part of their capital stack. It's not, um, it certainly is not impossible, but in order to do that, you, you will have to give up some ownership interest of, of that property um, because you cannot own 100% of a fund that is investing in, in property that you owned prior to, um, to the, the creation and investment in the fund. Um, and so when I said 19.9%, that's that 20% standard that's referenced there. Oftentimes, um, a unrelated party standard in the in the code is a 50% standard, so it's it's interesting that this is even more narrow um, than that unrelated party standard typically is. Um, so this is I, when I said I think it's a little questionable. You know, I from a public policy standpoint, to me it says that that the people who live and own property in these zones are not the best people to be potentially investing and growing in them. Um, that somebody has to come in essentially from the outside um, and invest in order for this program to work. So that, um, I, that may not have been their intent, but um, that is this is a roadblock that, that some people are coming up against when they say, I've got property, I would love to improve it and then realize that, that it's gonna be limited, their, their use of this program is gonna be limited. Um, so going on to the next, during substantially all of the holding period, substantially all of the use of the property is in a qualified opportunity zone. So this is pretty straightforward, but it's again, it's a reason that at least at this point, real estate um, is somewhat favored, similar to new markets. You know, it's a place-based um, in incentive, which means that it's, it's safer if you have things that can't move. Um, and that's pretty basic. This also means that it could be great for, you know, large pieces of tangible property as well, you know, large laundry mats or printing presses or, you know, equipment that is, you know, worth millions of dollars that's not going to be moving around, um, that this would be great for that. Um, if you are an, an operating company and it's not a real estate play, uh, you know, you're going to have to make sure that, that your computers and you know your your whatever else you own whatever whatever tangible property you own that you want to count towards this um, stays in the zone um, during substantially all of the holding period and here's we don't know what substantially all means in either of these uses in that sentence we get it twice in this one and we don't have clarity on what either of those mean um, and hopefully that clarity will will be forthcoming in the next round of guidance um, and then our next uh, requirement is this is the either or test that original use in the zone commences with the taxpayer or the taxpayer substantially improves the property. Um, so substantial improvement we know is during any 30 month period after acquisition, 
additions to the basis exceed an amount equal to the adjusted basis of the property at the beginning of such period. So let's talk about what that means. That means that in order to qualify for a substantial improvement, the taxpayer, the, the fund essentially needs to double the basis in the property. Um, we, the, the, there was some concern when this first came out that, well, what if we live, if we're thinking about real estate, what if I live in New York City? And uh, the value of the land um, here is $2 million for this lot. Um, and for the building on it is only, you know, 250,000. How can I double the basis? So the whole thing is I paid 200 and 2 million, 250,000 for this entire property. How can I double the basis um, in that property to meet the substantial improvement requirement with the value of the land being that high? Right? So essentially now I have to, I have to build a, a 200 and, $50 million building, um, my math is not right there, but two, two, million, two million plus building um, instead, which is a huge improvement to this, to this building. So um, Treasury heard those comments and responded with the guidance and said that, okay, um, in order to substantially improve property, what you're looking at is not the basis in the land, but the basis only in the improvements. So if you have a piece of property where the value of the land is 200,000 and the value of the building is 200,000 to meet the substantial improvement requirement, you have to invest an additional 200,000 to double the basis of the improvements instead of an additional 400,000. So this is a huge, um, a huge benefit uh, to those in, in the real estate industry. Um, it also has raised some questions uh, that that hopefully they will we'll have more guidance on, you know, what, what happens uh, just with vacant land? What, what kind of improvements do you need to do if you're only um, improving vacant land? Can you have vacant land and pave over it and make it a parking lot? Is that a substantial improvement? Um, and if so, is that really what the program wants to, to create parking lots in these low-income communities? You know, or could you put, if you have vacant land, can you put a tiny little shack on it and then just land bank? Um, so there, there is concerns about, about abuse um, as relates to substantial improvement and vacant, vacant land. Um, and we're hoping for additional clarity there. So going back to um, the other element of the either or test, um, the original use in the zone commences with the taxpayer. Uh, so this could mean if you're an operating entity that you purchase new equipment and um, and you, uh, you start using that equipment in the zone. Um, that, that would be an easy way to meet this original use test. Um, There's some questions about if we're thinking about real estate, how this works in, in a real estate context. Um, original use, if, you know, if, if potentially there's a building um, that has never been inhabited or used before, and uh, um, the building is purchased by the fund and the fund starts using it, um, that could qualify as original use. Um, there's also, uh, we're also looking for guidance and Treasury asks for comments as to the treatment of vacant, um, vacant buildings and how vacant, how and if vacant buildings might qualify as original use. Um, if anybody's familiar with enterprise zones, the federal enterprise zone program actually has some precedent for, it has a similar original use requirement um, but the uh, um, regulations around enterprise zones say that if a property, a building has been vacant for 12 months or more, that any use prior to that 12 month period will be disregarded um, for this original use purpose. And, and that new use will be considered an original use. So this, if, if you know, I certainly am hoping that um, Treasury takes this position um, with, with vacant property as well, um, because I think that that would be a substantial, if we think about all of the vacant properties in these communities, um, that would, to, to be able to qualify as um, qualified opportunity zone property um, by moving into these, you know, purchasing the property and moving in and starting to use them again, um, seems to me to fit the intent of the program um, and, and would have a, um, 
an impact on these communities too. So, but, but we are looking for additional guidance on that. Okay. So with that, um, I think that is, that's kind of a walkthrough of, of the, the bones of the program. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to talk about um, some comparisons with other tax uh, incentives um, and, um, and talk about, then talk about what, uh, what the takeaway should be from, from various parties with various perspectives. So looking at 1031s, um, there's obvious comparisons to 1031s here, mostly in that it's a tax deferral. They're, these are both tax deferral programs. I've heard this talked um, called 1031 on steroids. Um, I think that's that's very true uh, to a point. Um, so it, it makes sense to kind of walk through and, and compare and contrast them. Um, so unlike 1031s, there's no like kind requirement for opportunity zones. So you can take your capital gains out of the stock market and invest them in real estate. You could take real estate and you could buy um, stock or a partnership interest with it. Um, you can change from one kind of real estate to another kind of real estate. There's, there is no, it doesn't matter where your gains came from as long as they're capital gains. Um, there's no qualified intermediary necessary uh, with opportunity zones. So um, for in the case of opportunity zones, um, the, your gains, the money is fungible, also to the point where you could, it, it appears you could realize your gains, sell, sell your asset, realize your gains, decide that you want to buy something really nice with those gains, um, and then 175 days later, regret that choice, realize that you don't want to pay the taxes on it, so take out a loan for the amount of those capital gains and then invest that cash into a fund. Um, so we know that, that at, at least as it stands now, um, the, these, your gains that you're investing in the fund is completely fungible. Um, there's no initial property identification necessary for opportunity zones. You just have to have it in a fund in 180 days. Uh, in fact, we think that um, this is going to be used quite a bit by people who have 1031s gone wrong, um, that, you know, once they, they identify their property, but day 170 comes and they haven't closed and the deal falls through, um, and suddenly they're facing a tax bill that they weren't planning on seeing, um, they could very quickly create a fund uh, and then put those um, those gains into the fund and defer those taxes. Uh, an interesting point is that when the tax bill comes due in 2027, remember we have that December 31st, 2026 taxable event where regardless of how long, um, regardless of the fact that you still have your investment in the fund, you have a tax bill to pay. Well, that's a cash flow issue. Um, typically when you have a tax bill to pay, you and for capital gains, you've sold something, and so you actually have cash to pay that tax bill. In this case, you've sold something, invested your cash, and now you have a tax bill with no cash to pay for it. So there's some long-term planning that needs to occur here. Um, for investors that, that are going to be investing in large um, blind pool funds where they're just, you know, something like a mutual fund, they're going to have to think about how am I going to pay those taxes December 31st, um, 2026, and how, it, if I put my money in the fund, is there something in the fund where there'll be some kind of liquidation? Will I receive um, cash from the fund in order to pay that bill? Or am I going to have to, you know, potentially um, take out a loan to pay that? Or am I going to escrow, you know, what, what, what is the taxpayer going to do in order to pay that bill? Um, that's something you don't have to think about for 1031s. And, um, Part of that, and a big distinction here, is that for 1031s, you can continuously defer. Um, and that's not, that doesn't happen with Opportunity Zones. The Opportunity Zones, December 31, 2026, you're going to have a taxable event. You're going to have to pay taxes on your original game. Um, with 1031s, you do have the benefit of continuous deferral.
So um, for those that are um, listening who represent municipalities that have um, to districts and use TIF, um, it's this is opportunity zones are are if you have opportunity zones in your municipality, um, it's great to think about how if they are not already in um, a TID, how you might um, create a TID to align with your opportunity zones um, in order for you to incentivize um, additional um, opportunity zone investment. Oftentimes, um, opportunity zones already align with these districts, which is great where they do. Um, the tax increment finding, financing and opportunity zone capital work really well for a project together. I mean, um, TIF is, is very flexible and opportunity zone capital when it comes into a deal really can just be viewed as, a, as another set of equity. So no timing complications, which is great. Um, and then it, because we're trying to cre make, create an increment with, um, with TIF, uh, that, that generally falls well within the substantial improvement for opportunities. Um, let's see. So, and, and I also know that some municipalities are, are looking at how to, um, how to, I, I think it's actually Madison that's, that um, is looking at an ordinance that would say that if it's in an opportunity zone, that meets the but for requirement that's qualified for, that's required for TIF financing. Um, so there's there are a lot of people who are um, being very innovative and looking at ways to really uh, incentivize um, investors to, to use this program. Um, so looking at new market tax credits, I, as I said um, several times, you know, this program has, has has elements that are very reminiscent of new markets. Um, and it, so where those programs align, um, that's great. You know, there's similarities between the requirements of a quality uh, under new markets law and a qualified opportunity zone business under OZ law. Um, certainly the list of SIN businesses is the same. Um, your census tracts, nearly all qualifying new market census tracts will be opportunity zone census tracts. Uh, I say nearly, and this is a, a little point to make about opportunity zones, is that each state was allowed to designate 5% of its opportunity zones to, zo to census tracts that are not low-income communities, but that are contiguous to low-income communities. Um, so I, I was told, or I don't know if you know if this is true, but I was told that Wisconsin did not identify any contiguous zones. No. Nope. Um, so, but on the other hand, if you look at Amazon's new headquarters um, in Long Island, part of that is in a zone and that is a contiguous zone um, where I think rent, rental rates for two bedrooms are $4,300 a month. <clears throat> so, um, uh, we also have the 5% NQFP issue. There's, there's some places where the program aligns. Um, the bad news is, is what's really complicating this structure. And that is, you know, first CDEs make loans to the quality fee. Um, and where, where we're looking at structures um, where an, a new markets investor might be able to use capital gains and double the, double the benefits by getting opportunity zone benefits on top of the new markets tax credits. Um, in those cases, the, the CDEs would have to make equity investments in the quality fee. Um, and that would require CDEs uh, potentially to uh, change their applications um, to CDFI, uh, showing how their allocations are going to be used. Um, it also would eliminate um, certain safe harbors that would make uh, those investments riskier than loans are. Um, and then a big one is that um, investors in new markets transactions uh, generally exit after seven years. And that's that's a pretty, <laughs> that is, I, I, I have not seen a new markets transaction where an investor hangs out longer than absolutely required. And that is seven years. Um, but opportunity zone investors would need to be um, in the deal for 10 years in order to get the full benefit of the program. So that timing, uh, that, that timing is, is significant. 
Um, there are uh, certainly parties who are, you know, crunching the structure and trying to find ways to make it work. And I imagine that that um, it, it will be it will be tried, um, but it is it, we're going to be twisting ourselves into a pretzel um, to get there. I think. Um, now, of course, when I talk about uh, the difficulty here, I'm talking about the difficulty of a tax credit investor, of a new markets investor, um, using capital gains as its investment to take advantage of the program. Um, we can certainly, a, a qualified opportunity fund could certainly invest directly into a qualify or into your borrower and thereby avoid the whole new market structure. Um, <clears throat> that would be certainly a, a, something that would work. So when we say, when we're talking about pairing opportunity zones with new markets, um, and this, the, the same will apply for LIHTC and historics, it is, it is much more complicated if it's the tax credit investor that's going to be using um, the opportunity, the capital gains and taking advantage of the program. Um, if, it's, if it's an investor um, that's just going to direct to invest directly into the sponsor or the quality or the borrower or the project itself, um, then, you know, all of the structural issues that, that come um, really don't, don't apply. Um, so looking at LIHTC here, uh, this is, and I apologize, it looks like these slides are cut off a little bit, so, um, and they're cut off on my on my printout too. So we're all cut off. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so um, LIHTC actually lines up pretty well. Um, part of that is, you know, if we go just right to the hold, um, the holding period, you know, that that um, with opportunity zones, it's a minimum of 10 years. Really, you can hold that investment in the fund for much longer than that, out to 2047, and still be able to um, take advantage of that um, ultimate 10-year benefit so where in LIHTC you have a um, 10, 15 year hold, um, then that, that lines up pretty well. Uh, this, it, this would work for construction of new low income housing. Um, rehabilitation might be a little trickier. Uh, it might be tougher to hit that substantially, substantial improvement requirement for rehabilitation, but certainly for, um, for new construction. Um, and uh, you know one of the one of the tough parts is that um, the and, and this goes with other tax credit programs it's it, the the investors don't necessarily line up super well so um, tax credit you know low income housing tax credit investors um, may or may not be flush with capital gains um, and so that investor class may may or may not line up um, the the one I think um, important play for potential LIHTC investors is that if if we were to go all the way back to our um, description of deferral, and if you remember that the amount that is due um, on December 31st, 2026 is the lesser of the original capital gain invested or the fair market value of the interest in the fund. Um, less the basis. So if you think about that, and if you have a tax credit investor who um, knows that their investment in the property is going to lose value um, because of the tax credits, because of the fact that this is um, property encumbered with rental restrictions, you know, typically um, low income housing tax credit projects actually, you know, lose value rather than gaining value, um, that, that investor, the play could be potentially to reduce that tax bill. Um, so if, for example, the, uh, the investor had a million dollars in capital gains, invested that in, um, to a low income housing tax credit project, and at the end and on December 31st, 2026, the, the value of the investment in the fund went from a million dollars to $500,000, then what the taxpayer, what that investor is going to pay taxes on is $500,000 less that step up in basis. 
So the taxpayer is actually going to pay taxes on $350,000 instead of a million dollars, which would be its original tax bill. Um, so that's a really interesting play, I think, for tax credit uh, investors. Um, it wouldn't be about the 10-year hold and the appreciation necessarily, but the but really about um, that tax liability, reducing that tax liability. Um, historic cre tax credits. Um, lots of people are bully on uh, on lining up opportunity zones with historic tax credits. Um, here you're talking about a credit for rehabilitation. Um, often uh, it, it the substantial improvement requirement for opportunity zones lines up well here. Um, oftentimes these uh, these buildings, historic buildings are in um, older, more urban settings that may overlap with the opportunity zones. Um, and uh, the timing period um, is, while it's short of the desired 10 years, um, uh, you know, is, is, is a little bit, a little bit closer. Um, again, there's there's a not a great lineup necessarily between um, historic investors and um, and opportunity zone investors who need capital gains, but certainly those folks are out there. Um, and historic tax credits um, are typically used. Uh, oftentimes, those projects see great appreciation, um, and so that that 10 year appreciation benefit um, can can be a, a really strong benefit. There's several structures for historic tax credit, um, for using opportunity zones for historic tax credits. Um, and and I, I, I do think that, that you'll be seeing these, these deals happening. So takeaways for real estate developers. Um, new construction in opportunity zones work well. Remember when we talked about substantial improvement, new construction, super easy to hit that. Renovations of existing structures must meet that substantial improvement test, so doubling the basis in the building. Um, there is the potential that original use could be applied to vacant structures. Also, uh, something to think about if you own property and you're looking for tenants and you're, the property you own is in an opportunity zone, remember that this is opportunity zones are a play for tenants also. Um, so if, if it, it may be additional incentive for a tenant to come into your building if they could create a fund um, and receive capital for their business through that fund because they're located in an opportunity zone. And then opportunity zone capital can be layered with other financing incentives. It plays it plays well with others. Takeaways from municipalities, um, and this is really important. I've talked to a lot of different municipalities who are wondering, you know, what their role is in this. And and it, so first. Um, if you are a municipality and you have an opportunity zone within your boundaries, really you need, in addition to understanding the program itself, understand you know, what the assets are in that zone. Um, understand what your priorities for development are in that zone, who your stakeholders are, um, what the greatest selling points are in that zone. Um, add opportunity zone notifications on marketing materials for city-owned real estate in opportunity zones. Um, that's a potentially, you know, easy addition to, to a website to put a little stamp or seal on, on any property um, that you may be selling that's in an opportunity zone. Look at alignment with tax increment districts. We talked about that already. Um, communicate with your core developers and corporate stakeholders about the benefits. So don't, um, you know, don't assume that everybody knows about this program and understands its benefits. If you know that there are developers that are doing great work in your city, reach out to them and ask if they know about this program and if they know, you know where the zones are in, in your municipality. Um, likewise, with, with stakeholders, with large industries, with, um, with, with groups that have the potential to, to invest, um, let them know, you know about this program and, um, and the impact that it could have. Um, also, municipalities may consider facilitating a fund for local projects. Um, I there there is um, a lot to be said for the idea of creating a, a 
place specific fund. Um, of course, you would need, as a municipality, you would need to determine if you're comfortable taking on the role of fund manager. Um, if you were taking uh, investments um, from the public for use in, for example, you know, certain development projects in your municipality, you would need to be really careful about following securities laws and um, and um, taking on and the liability that you might take on being a fund manager, reporting requirements, so on and so forth. So it's not a small step to take, um, and I think a lot of municipalities are have kind of shied away from that uh, just because of that potential risk. Um, but if, if that's something that you think that you're um, sophisticated enough to do and willing to do um, to, to take on that risk, it could have um, great potential there. Um, and you know a lot of this is is about marketing uh opportunity zone capital can come from anywhere um but it can also go to anywhere so how do you it, it, it there are going to be funds all over the country that are are going to be you know huge funds looking for investments in areas that these funds would not typically invest in so um, how do you attract the attention of those funds? Um, how do you get people to realize the, the potential um, for development that, that is in your municipality? Um, obviously the internet is the, is the easiest way to do that. Um, so think about creating a, a dedicated Opportunity Zone webpage. I will tell you people are Googling things like Opportunity Zone Milwaukee all the time trying to figure out where these things are and, and what they should do if they have capital gains that, that they want to invest in these zones. All right, so that's me. Um, if, you, uh, if you have any questions, um, would like you know, additional clarification, please feel free um, to reach out. I'm in um, Hush Blackwell's Milwaukee office. Um, I'm also co-leader of our Opportunity Zones team. Um, which uh, is more than 25 attorneys from all different disciplines, including um, private equity, fund formation, real estate development, um, tax, 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 um, <laughs> lots of people with expertise in all of the different nooks and crannies of, of this law. So um, I, would, I would encourage you to, to reach out and, and let us know if you have any questions or if there's anything that you can do to us, we can do to assist. Right now we are... Um, advising municipalities, creating funds, um, uh, thinking really creatively about, about interesting structures that could um, be really beneficial both on the real estate development and private equity um, sides of things. So um, we, have, we have lots of ideas and um, lots of expertise in this area. And with that, I will hand it over to Farshad, who's been waiting so patiently. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to have as much um, detail, but um, thank you, Rebecca. That was an excellent overview of the program. I think gave us some real meat on um, opportunity zones and how they work and um, what opportunities we have to combine this program with other programs. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Wisconsin-specific things and just some policy things related to the program. Um, first, why why such an emphasis on opportunity zones? Why is it that um, you know entities like um, you know Hush Blackwell and WIDA are you know really um, excited about this program? One is, as you know, Rebecca had noted, uh, conservatively, I'm going to use a much more conservative number. There's easily about three trillion dollars of potential investment from this program, and let's just compare that three trillion compared to 3.5 billion to 7 billion annually that's available through new market tax credits. Um, for LIHTC, low income housing tax credits in Wisconsin, it's about um, 785 million annually. With, you know, if you wanna consider the 10 year nominal value, 7.85 billion. The thing is, even uh, you know 1% of that total investment potential pool is more than new markets and low income housing tax credits combined. So the scope of this program is so much larger and the players in it is such a much larger environment than all of the tax credit um, programs combined. 
So that's one of the reasons that we're, you know, we're very excited and interested in figuring out ways to make this a successful program. And also, you know, frankly, to get as much investment capital into Wisconsin through this program, you know, as possible. So let me talk a little bit briefly about how we selected Wisconsin's opportunity zones. And as Rebecca noted, it was very difficult because remember that we could only select 25% of areas that already are designated of, as being in you know, low income or, or in, of great need. So we could only select um, 120 um, census tracts out of 479. Um, that were qualifying. And we went through a very extensive review process for this. And one of the, we, we, in addition to need, two important criteria for us were, let's see how, first, how can we pick um, zones that also overlay with other programs that may attract investors, especially things like the affordable housing tax credit. So for example, um, 69% of these low, of these of our OZs in Wisconsin are in high housing need areas. Um, more importantly, perhaps 63% are in low income housing tax credit qualifying census tracts. These are census tracts that can get a higher boost of um, LIHTC um, tax credit benefit and also are usually scored higher as well in, quali in our qualified allocation plan. So it makes it much easier to blend the LIHTC with, um, the, any, with, the, select, with the selected OZs. 28% um, are in the city of Milwaukee and we made a real effort to try to, um, to, put, to select air, rural areas as well with 39% being in, um, you know, in, in rural communities. But another critical component is, is not just need and not just overlay with other programs, but you have to have areas where we thought we could also have investor interest. So there may be an area that has great need, okay, no one would doubt it, but there would be absolutely no investor interest in going into that area. And so that's just not a good choice. It would be a wasted choice because we don't have, we have to select areas that would be interested in investment through the OZ. And it's not just about me. And that's just something to please um, you know, keep in mind. So what about, you know, Wisconsin specific things to try to promote the program? Well, you know, of course, with WIDA, we're a housing authority, and we're very interested in having OZ, the OZ program blend well with affordable housing tax credits. So as Rebecca noted, um, this program blends very well with the 10-year period, holding period of um, LIHTC deals. LIHTC deals traditionally have a 10-year exit for the investors. Another thing is that LIHTC has very predictable start and exit dates. So it also makes it more amenable to this. You'll know exactly when at least you plan to exit and can um, be able to see exactly what would be your technical or your, your calculated um, you know, capital gain benefit from, you know, from the period of time of, the, of your investment. But one thing that um, WIDA and the state of Wisconsin have also done is we created the state affordable tax credit, which provides an additional subsidy to make more 4% tax credit deals, 4% federal light tech tax credits are not competitive. We have a nearly unlimited supply from the federal government. So by having that state affordable housing tax credit, it provides more, more bonus or, or, or subsidy for 4% deals, which can also then be now overlaid with opportunity with the benefits of the Opportunity Zone program to hopefully make more 4% affordable housing tax credit deals viable. So for municipalities that have Opportunity Zones, it's important to not just focus on the 9% tax credits, but also the fact that you will have, um, you know, um, opportunities to have more investors come in with affordable housing tax credit, 4% tax credit deals, especially if it's combined with the, um, with the state affordable housing tax credits. WIDA also specifically is giving additional points to projects, LIHTC projects that locate 
in um, opportunity zone areas and, and, in, and a pretty substantial boost to projects that are non-metro, that is rural opportunity zone areas. So just keep that in mind that we are trying to incentivize um, the LIHTC program, which as Rebecca noted, fits pretty well with OZs to really encourage more investment um, of, in housing, especially in the 4% housing space in OZ areas, but especially um, you know, in, in rural communities. Now, for new market tax credits, the seven-year tax credit period at least matches well with someone that may just really be primarily in happy, you know, to just get the additional boost of the, you know, 15%, you know, write-off. Another thing that we're trying to do, is, this is more exotic, is try to figure out how when you do the put call for an exit on a new market tax credit deal, if we can structure that put call so as, a, as kind of a capital gain event, it's, in other words, so that the ordinary income event is a capital gain event, which can then, of course, benefit from the tax credit. Now, related to that, though, may be the need to have the investor um, be willing to hold, you know, not... Um, you know, collapse the structure um, until 10 years, you know, so that that, would, you know, would be um, facilitated. But again, that's something that, um, if, you know, folks at Push Black will can help us try to um, hopefully um, figure out. And I think that that's one of the things that Wisconsin has is we have an experienced pool of professors, professionals like Rebecca, who are, who are um, tax credit experts and actually are, you know, tapped throughout the country to, to um, on figuring out puzzles, um, you know, like this. For commercial real estate, um, I think it's very important to try to see where you can create the tax obligation on a commercial real estate deal as a capital gain from sale after 10 years. So maybe you, you know, try to don't take as much income, you know, and try to kind of defer your quote unquote profit rather than pulling it out from, you know, from, 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 um, you know, payments try to see if you can structure your gain in a project as a capital gain after the 10 year period to again, maximize the tax benefit that you can gain from it. For municipalities, I really would emphasize the importance of trying to make your TIF programs be as OZ friendly and dovetail as well with TIF. I think a critical component of that is to essentially have pretty much the, I'll call it the payment quote unquote, of the TIF be, come from the increment, um, the increase in value, rather than having like some stock payment that the developer makes to the community. Again, you want to have everything structured for capital gain to, so that the developer can have the maximum tax advantage um, from that structure. And also one program that we, we'd really like to highlight is the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands. This is a source for very low cost capital that can be very easily dovetailed as a sidecar to promote or incentivize OZ investors to locate in your community rather than others. So if you can provide, you can say, all right, look, in this particular OZ zone, we will also provide X amount of you know low cost financing that will finance through the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, the BCPL program. I do think that that's a uh, you know a program that again can be dovetailed and can be a very valuable sidecar um, benefit for OZ investments you know in in your communities. Other possible resources that can be you know um, dovetailed with OZs are um, you know PACE um, you know property assessed clean energy investment funds, there's actually a couple national funds that are looking to, um, you know, which, who are willing to do PACE in OZs, and that's just something to, you know, um, you know, keep in mind. Another is community development financial institutions, um, entities like um, Local Initiative Support Corporation National is trying to see if they can get some more mission-based investors to to have national pools to provide capital, lower cost capital in um, in opportunity zones, and I, I would definitely, you know, um, Google Lisk like every four, you know, maybe every month to see um, where those things go. But also just CDFIs and and OZs to see, especially national CDFIs that may have resources to. Um, sidecar, even though as I think Rebecca knows in Milwaukee, I know that Northwest Side Community Development Corporation is one local 
um, CDFI, community CDFI, that is looking at providing some low cost capital to um, you know, projects that are, are, are taking advantage of the OZ um, you know, program. And again, um, there, there are gonna be national, regional and local investment funds that will be actively looking for OZ um, investment opportunities. But for communities, I think it's very important that it's understood that the more sidecar benefits you can have or provide in your OZs, the more likely you're gonna be able to attract um, you know, these um, sources of investment. The final thing I would say is that govern, um, President Trump just established uh, Opportunity Zone Commission that is being headed by um, the Secretary of HUD, you know, um, HUD, um, Ben Carson, um, to try to see how OZ um, can be, you know, can, can be dovetailed or blended with other federal programs. And this commission does have the power to make suggestions and actually um, suggest legislative changes. And I think that if you, you know, if you are interested in trying to have some changes to the program, maybe expand the number of areas, other things, that would be perhaps the best vehicle to try to do it. Of course, some of us, you know, we belong to, um, you know, the, um, the Novogratic, um, you know, working group, and we're trying to just work out the technical things, but, in terms of an entity that may have the political clout to make legislative changes, that might be the you know the one thing that I would you know keep keep in touch and see what's you know what's going um, on there. Well, I, I first I want to thank everybody for being patient. At least most of you haven't <laughs> buzzed out here, and hopefully we provided you you know uh, uh, um, some information or resources that will be helpful to you. Um, again, um, I'm Prashad Maltez and I'm available at WIDA for questions and, and Rebecca, of course, is also available, you know, at, to follow up questions. We did get questions, you know, prior to the, um, to the webinar and we tried to incorporate answers through our presentations. We do plan to do future webinars, so I would encourage, you know, feedback on additional topics or um, quite specific questions perhaps that we still haven't addressed that you would um, you know, like to have addressed and we'll try to address those in um, you know, future events. Also, WIDA through our business and community engagement group plans to also have um, regional um, events on, on informational events and opportunity zones as well. So um, we hope to, to you know, we, for WIDA does believe that this will be a, a valuable resource for Wisconsin, and in the same way that with new market tax credits, um, we were able to really get a, a good foothold in that program. We Wisconsin ranks um, fourth per capita in our NMTC awards. Um, we want to have the say, kind of stay ahead of the of the curve with opportunity zones and hopefully maximize the amount of investment through this program that comes to Wisconsin. And as Rebecca noted, the clock is ticking. Really, um, if they don't change anything. We the, it really um, the, the, this is a perishable resource. It starts to lose value for deals that do not close before December 31st of 2019. So it's important to act quickly if we want to take advantage, you know, um, of this program. Again, um, I want to thank everybody. Um, we will again um, be a, um, asking for feedback and questions that we'll try to answer um, in other forums and vehicles um, in the future. But again, I um, want to thank everybody that um, participated and we hope that um, this was helpful um, to you. Take care.